Hello, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here today and to get to present to everyone um, at this NIH workshop on inclusion across the lifespan. I will be speaking to you today on the inclusion of pediatric populations, specifically in clinical trials. My name is Florence Bourgeois, and I'm a pediatrician and an associate professor of pediatrics at Harvard Medical School. So, in the way of background on the issues with the inclusion and exclusion of pediatric populations in clinical trials, historically, children have been largely underrepresented in clinical trials. And this is illustrated in this figure, which depicts the rise of controlled clinical studies beginning in the 1950s. And you can see that there was really a sharp influx that has occurred over the past decades, mostly for the adult populations. The pediatric trials, which are the darker blue line on the bottom, really have not seen much activity in the way of increased uh, randomized control trials. The reason this matters is that this contributes to the clinical care that is not always evidence-based. So, for example, currently, it's estimated that about 52% of drugs do not have pediatric prescribing guidelines. And instead, physicians widely extrapolate findings from adult studies and use products in children without age-specific research on dosing, safety, or efficacy. And this endpoint is directly related to the inclusion and exclusion criteria that have been applied to drug studies over the years. There are a number of barriers to the inclusion of children in clinical trials, and many of these are very well justified. They're principally centered on ethical and legal considerations, and also on financial considerations and incentives from the perspective of sponsors. So in terms of the ethical and legal issues in the US, research must involve no more than minimal risk to the child in order for the child to be enrolled. Or if the risk is greater than minimal, there are three specific criteria that need to, one of three specific criteria that need to be met. And these are either the research must present potential for direct benefit to the child. The research must be likely to yield generalizable knowledge about the participant's condition, or it must present an opportunity to understand, prevent, or alleviate a serious problem affecting the health or welfare of children. So in, in essence, the acceptable risk is much lower for pediatric populations than it is for adults, which is then related to the fact that children cannot, which is related to the fact that children cannot provide informed consent, and this creates additional challenges um, in recruiting and then including children in trials. The financial considerations are related to the higher costs that result from these additional barriers, and also from the fact that children are a smaller proportion of our population, they are inherently healthier, so there's a smaller pool. This means that sponsors, for example, need to set up many more sites, which is expensive, in order to obtain robust numbers for uh, for sample sizes in, in studies. And this also ultimately results is related to the fact that there's more limited prospects for profit for since there's a smaller market for many conditions compared to adults. So the incentives to conduct clinical trials tend to be lower in kids versus adults. COVID-19 presents a very nice use case to examine how these factors play out in terms of the inclusion of children in clinical trials. So beginning in March, when the COVID-19 pandemic was unfolding, many organizations quickly um, were able to design and launch large global clinical trials. Many of these were multi-center. Some were funded by government sources, such as the NIAID, uh, the WHO, and also many uh, specific sponsor-related trials by Gilead and others. Um, looking at a number of different interventions in the, with the goal of finding a, um, a treatment. What's interesting is how children were included in, in these trials. This figure is from a analysis that we published back in April. And as you can see, beginning in February, the increase in interventional studies is quite significant. That's the navy blue bar. But studies open to children are much, much smaller. So you can see by mid-April, there were 275 total interventional studies, and of those, just 30 were open to children. And I updated this analysis just a few days, or back in uh, early August, 
And you can see that we have seen even more trial activity now, close to 1,600 interventional studies, and of those 150, so less than 10% are open uh, to children. So the inclusion criteria do not allow for children to be enrolled. So one might argue, of course, that the greater safety data that are required for kids might explain this potential delay and lower rate of pediatric inclusion. And this is where it's interesting to take a closer look at remdesivir. So remdesivir was originally tested for Ebola virus disease, and the development program included phase three trials that enrolled children. The RCT was published in early December in the New England Journal of Medicine, and the findings indicated that there was no efficacy for Ebola, and so this was dropped as an indication. But because children were enrolled, there are dosing and safety data available for, for pediatric populations. Nonetheless, if you look at COVID-19 trials for remdesivir, there are a total of 19 interventional trials that were registered as of early August. And of those, just five were open to children. So there were three open to children 12 and older, one for any children less than 19 years of age, and one of unspecified um, age eligibility. So, of course, it's difficult to say all 19 of these should be open to children, but certainly I think what this indicates that there's room for improvement in terms of the standards and the norms for including children. And I think it's important to note that even the race to develop new therapies for COVID-19 generating high quality evidence to guide the treatment of children is necessary, it's feasible, and it could be done efficiently, which is precisely what the NIH policy was designed to address. So let's take a, a look at specifically what the um, NIH policy that went in effect in January 2019 calls for. In terms of the application and the proposals, what the policy requires is that these must include a description of the plans for including individuals across the lifespan. This includes the rationale for selecting specific age ranges. If certain populations are excluded, an acceptable justification must be provided. At the peer review stage, the scientific review groups at the NIH will determine whether the inclusion of certain age groups is acceptable or unacceptable. And then on an ongoing basis, the NIH recipients must then submit data on the participant age of the subjects or the participants who have been enrolled. In thinking about how this policy applies to children and what the impact, the potential for impact is to increase pediatric enrollment, I think there are two main considerations. The first is we need to think about whether the justification for the pediatric inclusion or exclusion plan is scientifically and ethically appropriate and well described. The second is whether the proposed enrollment for pediatric patients is feasible as well as scientifically meaningful. And what I mean by that is that extending the age eligibility down to include children may not be sufficient. We don't want pediatric eligibility to be merely a token inclusion. So, for example, for many interventional studies, including children in an adult study may not be sufficient to account for the unique enrollment requirements, and it also may not be scientifically meaningful. So, a separate pediatric study may be appropriate in some cases. In addition, children 0 to 18 years of age are not a uniform entity, and so pediatric age groups, in addition, must also be included and considered in the enrollment plan. So with these um, two main considerations in mind, we can now define some of the key elements to ensure successful implementation of the policy. So starting with the application requirements, it's critical that detailed descriptions of the inclusion exclusion rationale be given in the context of the study question. Information is also needed on specific numbers of children that need to be enrolled across pediatric age subgroups. And the rationale here is that significant changes occur in developmental pathophysiology from birth through adolescence, and this requires consideration of these specific age groups. And finally, information to assess whether the proposal, the proposed inclusion is scientifically meaningful are also necessary. Moving to the pre-award stage, we should note here that review panels will play a critical or do play a critical role in implementing the NIH policy. They are the ones who need to assess the plans and the rationales that have been proposed. So we need a process to ensure that there's appropriate pediatric expertise on review panels 
in order to evaluate the proposed inclusion and exclusion plan. And this includes whether the exclusion of children is justifiable, whether there's inclusion of children that is scientifically meaningful, and whether the proposed enrollment plan for the specific pediatric age groups is rigorous and feasible. Finally, the practices around public reporting and transparency also provide an opportunity to maximize the impact of the NIH policy. So the policy now requires that the NIH report at an aggregate level on the inclusion of relevant age categories every three years in its triennial report. But study level data on age-based inclusion and exclusion should be made available in a timely fashion. So this information could be provided, for example, on the NIH reporter or in clinicaltrials.gov, the online trial registry. And the benefit of this is that we enable the scientific community to perform more frequent analyses of the success and the impact of the NIH policy. It would also allow identification of opportunities and perhaps persistent barriers to inclusion. So in summary, the successful implementation of the NIH policy requires special considerations at the application stage, during the pre-award review, and also at the level of reporting and public disclosure. And in thinking about how to improve and fine tune this implementation on an ongoing basis, evidence-based improvements to the implementation will be facilitated by study level, real-time public reporting on age-based inclusion and exclusion plans, the rationales, and the actual enrollment in clinical studies. Thank you very much.